Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. So today's video is not a question to me, if you were wondering. The topic of today's video is, of course, what is like one of the greatest problems we have in transit and transportation planning, and how do we go about solving it? What is this problem? Well, I'm not sure there's a single word for it, but it's a certain narrow-mindedness, an ignorance to the outside world, if you will. A lot of different countries and cities exist around the world, and people planning in various geographies tend to only look at their adjacent surroundings when thinking of examples and places to kind of grab ideas from. This is a huge problem and possibly a disaster for global transit planning, and it's why we have a lot of work to do, especially in North America. If you're not already, consider following me on Twitter, my handle should be on the screen, as well as Instagram, uh, and supporting the channel on Patreon for early access to videos and some other goodies. So I've mentioned we have this huge problem with what I would call transit breadth of knowledge, something along those lines. It's basically what the transit or transportation planners think of when they're designing a route, or maybe what the policymakers are thinking of when they propose a new service or project. If you're looking for an example of what this kind of leads to, look no further than intercity rail in North America. Well, there is a ton of problems that lead to our poor quality intercity rail in North America, and this is speaking broadly. Even when we have good intercity rail, i.e. the Northeast Corridor, it still lags far behind the best intercity rail systems in the world. Now, as I mentioned, one of the big problems that leads to this is just a lack of breadth of knowledge. We have our own standards in North America regarding how rail vehicles are regulated. We have our own ideas about how a service should operate, about how much capacity a line can carry, about what kind of curvatures and safety standards are okay. And often we don't look at or consider what other countries do. What this leads to is an artificial ceiling above what we could potentially achieve in North America, be it with intercity rail, urban rail, or anything else. Now to be clear, this same effect can be seen globally, so I'm going to just run through a few examples. In Australia, you see a lack of skill in designing metros and other forms of urban rail. They do commuter slash regional slash suburban rail really well, but they really don't have much expertise in metro construction, which is why even when you see a cool project like Sydney Metro, it has a lot of questionable design decisions. Another country you could look at is China, who has fantastic metro systems and high-speed rail, but really lacks in its regional rail capabilities. To kind of prove my point, as I said that thing about Chinese urban rail, Ellen immediately commented that, why do you need commuter or suburban rail? Just take high-speed rail everywhere, which is exactly the problem. When you live in a certain context or mind space, you can't even consider that another option might be out there. Imagine a Paris RER style system in Shanghai or Beijing. It could be very powerful and it could have a lot of positive impacts. The whole model of building a metro to everywhere, which is not that different from say New York City, is not a perfect model. And replicating that in every city has a lot of issues. I mean, if you look at Canada, we have many of the same issues as the United States. We don't have great intercity rail. I mean, it doesn't exist across much of the country. We don't really have high quality regional rail. So we're not exempt from this either. And even some of the best transit cities and systems in the world have big blind spots. Look at the Paris Metro, for example. Its percentage of stations accessible and services accessible is horrendous. And this is, of course, in one of the systems that is the best in the world. There is no system which is perfect, and every system has things to learn about from other systems. Now, to be clear, this trend of only seeing what's in front of you is not 100% universal. It exists to some extent around the world but some countries are kind of overcoming it. And so a great example of that is Spain. Spain has done a lot of incredible things in recent years with urban rail and high-speed rail, as well as regional rail. Spain has incredibly low construction costs and they learn a lot from other countries. One thing that's interesting to see in Europe is that countries that are traditionally good at rail, like France and Germany, tend to not look outwards much at what other countries are doing. But countries that are kind of on the outside or the periphery look a lot more to these kind of expert countries and see what they do well, but they're not only limited to looking at these countries. I'll link an article by Alan Levy in the description that goes into this whole periphery, central, dynamic more. Suffice to say, when a geography is willing to look broadly along the world and not just at pure cities or even cities within a certain country, the outcome is typically fantastic. 
Spain now has one of the world's most extensive high-speed rail networks, and its major cities have surprisingly extensive urban rail networks, despite the fact that Spain is not that much larger than Canada. This is Madrid's metro system, and this is Toronto's. Now, to be clear, there are also cases where a sort of stream of knowledge flows from one region of the world to another. In North America in particular, it's really popular to look at the South and Latin American BRT systems in a very positive way. I remember long lectures in my undergrad career talking about Mexico City or Bogota's bus rapid transit systems. So to an extent, there is a certain pattern where if you are able to overcome this inward looking nature and you can see an example from outside of your own, I don't know, bubble, then you can have a huge impact. I think that researchers who brought all of this information about bus rapid transit from South America and Latin America to North America are largely responsible for spurring the explosion of bus rapid transit across the continent. While it's great that we know about bus rapid transit in North America, so much more needs to be done. For example, when Montreal was building the REM, it was amazing to me to see people commenting like, wow, an automated metro is this outlandish thing that doesn't exist broadly when cities from Copenhagen to Paris to Sydney to Vancouver all have these sort of systems. If you have this broad-based knowledge, you're not surprised when you see something like this proposed, and you can see when certain solutions might tailor themselves to different cities. This is even more important because imagine you're planning an automated metro project in Chicago, and the only automated metro system you're aware of is the Vancouver SkyTrain. While the SkyTrain has a lot of positives, there's also a lot of negatives. The trains aren't necessarily high enough capacity for a really large urban area, the system doesn't do great in snow, and there's some questionable design decisions on some of the earlier lines. So while Vancouver is a great example as a base case for an automated metro, looking at far more systems will give you a more holistic picture of how you can design a system which is great in all kinds of different areas, rather than just a few that one single system can be good at. Now, there's been an issue I've dealt with personally, posting videos about cities around the world that I want to bring up because I think a lot of people will probably deal with this if they try to get into conversations about other cities and bringing ideas from one place to another. There's two main effects that I see and that I want to address here. The first is when you want to comment on a city that isn't your own, people will often say if you haven't visited the city, you don't really qualify to talk about it. And this is super common. People have this sort of aversion to having people from the outside comment on their own city. The issue here is that you'll never have enough knowledge about a system to satisfy people who don't want to hear criticism about their own system. For example, first the argument is, you haven't visited the system. And then it's, you haven't lived here. And then it's, you haven't lived here for long enough. The reality is you'll never have perfect knowledge of any system in the world. Even people who live in a single city for their whole life don't have perfect knowledge because they haven't experienced other systems, which would give them the context in which to view their own. Now this isn't to say that local knowledge isn't super important. You can learn a ton by talking to people who live in a city. And there is certain knowledge that you'll gain by living in a city or spending time there that you truly would struggle to online or through conversations with other people. But this isn't the vast majority of knowledge. For example, I haven't spent a lot of time in Denver, but I have a pretty good understanding of their light rail and regional rail system, which they refer to as commuter rail, the type of thing you would only know if you went and talked to people from Denver and watched content from Denver. Now the fact that I call it regional rail is because I have a wider context, which suggests to me that systems that look like Denver's commuter rail are typically known as regional rail around the world. And they're typically known as regional rail for reasons such as the fact that they shouldn't primarily be targeted at commuters. Having this broad-based knowledge allows me to actually understand the flaws in something as simple as a naming scheme. Now the other problem you'll deal with is exceptionalism. Exceptionalism in transit is a big issue. People will say, just because it works in some other city, it can't work here. And it's often used to shoot down what would be logical ideas. For example, in Toronto, the infuriating Scarborough RT closure is very frustrating as someone from Vancouver. Does the Scarborough RT have some fundamental problems? For sure, but could a lot of smart ideas and techniques used in Vancouver be used to fix it up? For sure as well. The same exceptionalism leads to people in California, for example, arguing that their high-speed rail system needs to cost $100 billion, despite numerous examples of systems in earthquake-prone areas and with lots of farmland on the route, costing far, far less. Of course, no example from another city will ever be perfectly applicable to another, because as I mentioned before, cities truly are unique and they do have some unique elements. 
But if something works in another city, you should give it serious consideration for your own, because chances are a lot of it probably would cross over and still work in your own city. The truth is though that if something works in another city, there's not really a huge reason it can't work in your own. Of course, some details might need to be changed around, but if something works, the laws of physics still apply in every location on Earth. And this ability to kind of judge and cross-compare transit systems is not something that is inaccessible. You can go on Wikipedia and get some really high-quality ridership data, etc. from various systems. Of course, as I've made clear multiple times in this video, no knowledge is infallible, but you can get a relative sense to how different systems perform. Which is why, for example, I often talk negatively towards the Portland Bax, which has a lot of great elements, but which carries far fewer people than the Vancouver Skytrain. Portland Max has 100 stations, Skytrain has about 50, but Skytrain manages to carry roughly five times more people. These sort of numeric differences are too large to just chalk up to some inaccuracy in ridership data or the way things are counted. I think what all of these issues come down to is, in the end, people don't like it when you tell them that their system could do better. Citizens of various cities want the reason that their own system isn't good to be because of some unique reason. For example, in Toronto, we constantly talk about our system not being large enough because of political meddling by various people. But the truth is that every city deals with local politics. And while Toronto might deal with local politics a bit more than other cities, that's not an excuse for us having such a small subway system. The truth is, having broad-based knowledge about different systems and learning about things that are outside your personal bubble is the best way to get a better sense of if what you're doing is reasonable or absolutely ridiculous. And, as I talked about in a video I made this summer, it's never been easier and we've never probably had more time on our hands to learn about cities around the world. All it takes is opening up Google Maps or Wikipedia to learn about cities across the world that you've never even traveled to. A tip, by the way, try changing Wikipedia into the language of the country that you're looking at. You'll often find that the pages are much more thorough. So, to sum up this whole video, one of the issues we really face in North America, and to be honest, Australia and the United Kingdom as well, is our inability to look at the world broadly. We look at examples from across our various countries or at neighboring cities, but we don't look at what the best cities in the world for transit do, or even what cities that aren't necessarily known for their transit do. For example, Toronto's suburban buses, or Melbourne's tram system, or the Paris Metro, or Spain's high-speed rail, or cable car systems in South America. Cities around the world, as well as whole countries, have a lot for us to learn, and having a more broad or globalized view of the public transportation space can only make our discussions better and more intelligent. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.